And thank you, first of all, to you for coming again uh, this evening. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion we're going to have. Uh, it's entitled, What are British Values? Um, it's been a slightly controversial phrase thrown into the uh, political lexicon by uh, David Cameron when he was Prime Minister, slightly declined in prominence since uh, he was replaced by Theresa May, but raised a whole set of questions about what really do we mean by the phrase British values? Is there any distinction between British values and universal values? Do universal values exist in any kind of sense at all? How is the body of beliefs, culture, aspirations, attitudes which makes up Britain and the values which underlie many of our institutions, political, educational, and so on, uh, how has they, that been built up? And does it have a distinctive uh, description which uh, we can use to use the phrase British values? Some people felt that the Prime Minister, when he used that phrase, was trying to set the idea of British values against other values. I'm not sure that's a very fair criticism of him, actually. I think he was just simply trying to find a way of articulating uh, what were values that he felt were held in common in our society and to try and express it. It's had some practical implications. Uh, there is now uh, documentation to support the teaching of British values in British schools, and that's part and parcel of what goes on in schools in this country. Are there sections of society who somehow reject the idea of British values? Or is it in fact something which is fairly universally accepted? If we were doing this event in Paris, uh, would we be talking about French values? Would French values be different? Or in Washington, American values? Does Donald Trump represent American values in some sense at this moment? And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But as we think through British values, what makes them British in some meaningful sense? And does the phrase include uh, all faith groups, all members of society? That's what the conversation I'm hoping that we'll be able to have this evening. As Lee said, we've got a, an excellent round table. Uh, Bishop Graham James, I'll introduce individually in a second. Rabbi Roderick Young, Bishop Steve Carruthers, and Alem At uh, Atakav. Uh, from different dimensions. I'll introduce each of them individually in just a second, but I'm going to ask each of them to talk for 10 minutes on what they think British values are, and uh, hopefully we'll have all four, and then we'll have questions and discussion from the floor. We're kicking off this evening with Rabbi uh, Roderick Young, who has been active here for many years and is obviously coming from the Jewish tradition in respecting those values. Of course, um, a religion with an enormous history of values and culture of its own uh, right through this whole debate going back uh, centuries. So, Rabbi Young, would you like to kick us off this evening? Good evening. Oh, it's a bit loud. Um, I'm going to begin with a quotation from that most gentle and most British of authors, E.M. Forster. It's from what I believe, written in 1938, and it was a contentious quote when he wrote it, and possibly still is today. He said, I hate the idea of causes, and if I had to choose between betraying my country and betraying my friend, I hope I should have the guts to betray my country. Such a choice may scandalize the modern reader, and he may stretch out his patriotic hand to the telephone at once and ring up the police. It would not have shocked Dante, though. Dante places Brutus and Cassius in the lowest circle of hell because they had chosen to betray their friend Julius Caesar rather than their country, Rome. Now, why have I started with that quotation from 1938? Because I am made enormously nervous by the phrase British values just as I would be by the phrase Chinese values, German values, Greek values, so on and so forth. My plea would be for human values that know no borders. And I think that's what Forster was getting at as well. I believe it's the role of religion to be universal and not parochial. Let me reflect for a moment on my own family. 
My father's family were low church Anglicans and Methodists, in other words, Christians, from Cheshire and Lancashire. They were frugal, they were thrifty, and they had a sure and straight view of what sexual morality should be. They liked British beer. Indeed, some of them worked for the brewery. They didn't drink wine. They had a good, dry sense of humour. They didn't hold with a broad. My grandmother left the UK once in 87 years to go to a bridge tournament in the Republic of Ireland. And when, as a small boy, I speculated that I might emigrate to Canada, she told me she could never understand why anyone would ever leave their country. You might say that that is a very recognisable set of British values. My mother's family were Jewish, and all her ancestors arrived here between 1750 and 1841. They were dirt-poor peddlers and jewellers and furniture makers. Once they had assimilated, they became more patriotic than many a Brit whose ancestors had been here for a thousand years. They signed up and they died for Britain in droves in World War I. And once they had escaped the East End of London, they embraced British upper-class values, public schools, hobnobbing with royals, fox hunting, much foreign travel to places where Brits hung out. They were hugely charitable, deeply generous with money. They were outrageously funny. They believed in sexual freedom and they understood that as something that British society allowed. The British values understood and espoused by my Christian and my Jewish grandparents were vastly different. So which was more British? Therein lies part of my problem with the phrase. Within the practicing United Kingdom Jewish community today, we broadly have two groups, Orthodox and Reform. Both would and do say that they stand for British values. The Orthodox establishment believes that the Anglican Church should remain the official state religion as they believe that strengthens all religions in the UK. They opposed same-gender marriage, believing it undermines British family and society. Reform is very wary of one religious group dominating the country in any official capacity. They supported same-gender marriage as something equal and fair, and indeed referenced the British, qualities of, uh, the British qualities of equality and fair play for all families. Again, deeply opposing views. And perhaps, ultimately, that is what British values mean. The ability to allow contradictory views to live, grow, and flourish within one society. My mum's and my dad's family, Orthodox Jews and Reform Jews, under one roof. Maybe we Brits are particularly good at that. But we have to be careful that we don't squander the great British value of tolerance and openness. At the moment, it seems that anti-Semitism, racism, the inability to respect the other has become much more prevalent. I was listening to the radio the other day and I heard Professor Cox reflecting, Professor Brian Cox reflecting on recent political developments in the UK, Europe and the USA. And I loved his quote so much, I quickly wrote it down. He said, I am philosophically opposed to a trajectory that fragments the world. And the perspective that astronomy, cosmology, and science gives us is that we live on an extremely fragile, rare, and valuable planet. And the way we need to treat it means that we have to be on a trajectory to manage it together. And anything that divides rather than unifies, I think, is problematic. Professor Brian Cox. So, on the back of that, I would say, let's work towards human values and not just British ones. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> very powerful and interesting. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Roderick. Set us off extremely well. Uh, our second uh, contributor is Bishop Graham James, the Anglican uh, Bishop of uh, Norwich. Uh, I've known Graham for a very long time. He uh, arrived here 17 years ago, I think it was, and uh, 
I, I've always thought at the enthronement ceremony at the cathedral where you arrived and the splendid moment of the doors being thrown open and uh, the incoming bishop is there, that you were probably the first bishop to be enthroned in the Anglican Church in the third millennium because it was, uh, it was, very, it was just early, early uh, 2000. Um, we're delighted that you've come today. You've played many leading roles in the Anglican Church in Britain and we're very much looking forward, Graham, to what you have to contribute this evening. Well, thank you very much, Charles, and uh, it's good to be with you all. Uh, even if it's on a subject that I was puzzling as to how you can... Uh, try and summarise what you might think in 10 minutes, and that meant you had to think what you thought. Um, I'd like to say amen to nearly everything that Roderick has said. And as I was thinking about it, uh, where to begin, my mind went back to, I suppose it's about 10 years ago, when I was thinking about the values you would need to establish uh, in a newly created academy. Um, because I've been a governor of the Open Academy in Hartsey since its inception. It was, as um, Charles and many of you will remember, the very first academy in Norfolk. Bringing it to birth was a far from easy um, process. Um, some of the controversy was focused on the Christian ethos of the academy and the values it would espouse. For the first time in my life, I was accused of being a fundamentalist Bible basher um, that improved my street cred in some quarters. Um, it also taught me quite a lot about the religious illiteracy of our age, really. And I mention this because if you go to the Open Academy now, um, you see the core values proclaimed, I think quite attractively, um, on one of the outside walls of the school as you approach the main entrance. And there are no less than 12 of them, um, summed up in 12 words, each of which has a strap line, um, and I'll go through them. Aspiration, there are no barriers to your ambition. Leadership, live your own life. Teamwork, together we can achieve more. Humility, put others first. Courage, handle your fear. Hard work, we need to make the most of our talents. Respect. Treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. Service, it is better to give than to receive. Integrity, be true to yourself. Forgiveness, forgiveness is a friendship preserver. Thankfulness, appreciate others, appreciate what you have. Perseverance, never give up. And uh, I think such values are at the heart of a Christian ethos. They're not specific to Christian schools uh, or to the churches. They're certainly not restricted to Britain. Um, these qualities can be seen in many schools, many institutions. But I think a, a school or a society which champions such values should be the better for it uh, and for all faiths and none. And, of course, I like to believe that they rest secure in Christian teaching, but they're not actually obvious values upon which all people will agree. And at the last Ofsted inspection of the school, I was among a small group of governors to meet with a senior inspector, and that session, indeed the whole inspection went um, very well, but there was one moment at the end of that session when the senior inspector looked uncomfortable and what are you doing to promote British values, she asked. Would you tell me what they are, I said. <laughs> Things like tolerance and respect, she said. I drew attention to the core values I've just described. They were actually there in the room with us. And noted that tolerance wasn't one of them. We do not tolerate bullying and bad behavior, I said. Um, just to drive the message home. And there are necessary limits on what a civilised society tolerates, and yet very often when I'm asked what a British value is, it, tolerance is the very first thing that people will say. And I'm not sure, um, as Roderick said, that I believe in any values which are specific to Britain alone. And one of the achievements of the Open Academy on the Hartsey's estate is to create international links with schools in Netherlands and China. 
uh, and a significant proportion of the students gain some international experience, even if they've not travelled uh, widely in this country or in some cases hardly left Norfolk. Um, and the wider perspective, I think, stimulates their curiosity, feeds their aspiration, makes them feel they're not simply British, uh, but have a wider citizenship. And we possess, all of us, layers of belonging, you know, perhaps very local to the community of which we're part, networks nowadays uh, in which we socialize, as well as online, um, loyalty to city, town, county, country, Unfashionable though it may seem, loyalty to our continent. We are, after all, citizens of Europe. Whenever I hear people saying we're leaving Europe, I'm not quite certain where they're going to um, shove us, but there we are. But the values we hold ought to be those which enhance human dignity. And if I believe in uh, a distinctive thing called British values at all, it can only be, I think, in connection with my understanding of the relationship between ourselves, um, our nation, and the state. And when I'm overseas, I'm, I'm struck by how often people mention the Queen. Um, I shouldn't be, of course, because she embodies the nation. But I think, how is it that in a supposedly democratic and meritocratic society, the one element of our constitution, based on the hereditary principle, and which is privileged in the correct use of the term, is so loved by the people and honoured elsewhere in the world. I mean, the Queen's personal qualities, I'm sure, have got a great deal to do with it, but she is actually an unfashionable celebrity in many ways. She does not give interviews. Um, she does not promote her own opinions, though I'm sure she has plenty. Um, she's simply there, um, representative of a great many continuities within the state which she embodies. And she's called to her office. She's anointed in it. Uh, she doesn't see it as a job, but as a vocation. And the monarch fulfills that vocation to embody the nation, to give the state a human face. And that's not to do with political power, though there is a residual amount of it. But it has more to do with family, of course, which is um, where the hereditary principle holds in our own ordinary lives. Um, I don't think my children, adults as they are, have any truck with the hereditary principle, but I think they might when Julie and I die. Um, they might think that um, they might inherit something. <laughs> They're very keen on the hereditary principle. No, no, I won't say that. <laughs> as long ago as 1928, Archbishop William Temple said of the then king, the king is the impersonation of the community. When the king opens parliament, we see the community in his person calling on its servant, the state, to discharge its function. And, uh, and of course, as the state's powers have increased, it's become a very controlling servant in our lives. That's why there's a discernible unhappiness with its levels of surveillance. Um, so governments are unpopular. But we need to remember that Britain has an unwritten constitution and a great deal of our public life, and I think this is a British value, not unique to us, is based on a culture of trust. A culture of trust. We speak of broken states within the world and Syria is but one horrific example. Um, and what's broken down is trust between individuals, between groups of people, so that the community of the nation no longer exists but is divided and polarized in a host of different ways. And a functioning state fulfills its vocation by building a culture of trust between its citizens. And as I look at our country at its best, there is a culture of trust between us. But the state cannot do its job or fulfill its um, vocation if its citizens don't build cultures of trust among themselves. And that's why churches, faith groups, voluntary organizations, the little platoons, as Edmund Burke called them a couple of centuries ago, are so important. I don't know if you've ever come across, there's a German sociologist, um, Klaus Offi, and he wrote this. Institutions, if appropriately designed, can enable us to trust persons with whom we've never had contact and with whom we share no relevant communal allegiance. 
It's not obvious how this happens, as institutions are not like persons, as they cannot themselves be the object of trust. But institutions are endowed with a spirit, an ethos, values, which commit their members to the virtue of truth-telling. I trust anonymous others if I encounter them within a framework of institutionalised honesty and authenticity. And when trust breaks down, the state disintegrates, good government becomes impossible. Um, but that sort of trust of anonymous others, it's a very good phrase that, do you trust anonymous others, um, isn't the responsibility of politicians or simply those who govern us. It's our vocation, I think, within our church communities, within our faith communities, in all sorts of organisations, um, to trust anonymous others whom we do not know. And uh, we can never have a state within a system where the constitution is unwritten and which builds trust in a society of businesses, organisations, charities and all the rest don't build cultures of trust themselves. And that's a very distinctive characteristic, I think, of British values, this building of trust. It's no, it's no um, accident that Edmund Burke was talking about this in the wake of the revolution in France 200 years ago because I think that's the thing that makes us not distinctive from the rest of the world, but something upon which our public life rests. And when cultures of trust break down, there's no future for society or the state. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Graham. Very, very, very compelling indeed. Thank you. Uh, our third contributor is Bishop uh, Steve Carruthers uh, from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which some of you may know in Eton, uh, not very far from here at all. I think, Steve, you've been here for uh, about the same time that Graham has, 18 years, I think you said, and we're very much looking forward to what you're going to tell us this evening. Steve Carruthers. Thank you. Um, I guess I've come a little bit late to the party, so... Um I haven't had as much time to prepare for this as uh, I would have liked, um, and I'll, I'll kind of explain that as I go along. I thought it was uh, useful just to give you an, uh, an understanding of my background. So I'm a Bermudian Scouser. Um, my mom was from Bermuda, which is a, a British territory just off the coast of America, if you're not familiar. Uh, my father was from Liverpool. I'm grateful that he had lost his accent by the time they met. Um, I was born and raised in Galston, uh, not too far from here. So I'm very much a, a local Norfolk lad. Um, when I hit about 18, um, I started getting interested in religion. Um, my mum had joined the, the church, uh, the Mormon church, as uh, you may know it by its nickname. Um, I used to go along and play football um, and then got interested as a teenager. Uh, around about 18. Um, within a year or two, I went to serve a mission for the church. Um, we get that opportunity. We go for 18 months to two years, and it gives us the chance to go and share our faith and our beliefs and to serve in the community um, pretty much anywhere in the world these days. I got the chance to go to Atlanta, Georgia. So I lived in Atlanta for two years, um, worked primarily in, in amongst the, uh, the African-American communities and the Mexican communities um, and did that for two years. Um, I then, in later life, I've, I actually work here at the university. So I manage the admissions for the master's courses and look after all of the visa compliance for the university. Um, so again, I deal an awful lot with uh, different people from across the world. Um, and have had great fun and, and made some good friendships with um, people from all over, all over the world. Um, so, as I was thinking about the, uh, the topic this evening, so what are British values, um, I guess I was a lot like Roderick. I, I sat here and it was a, are there British values? Are there really just a set of British values that we could identify as a country? Um, are they really any different to those across the world? And having come from a, a background where um, I traveled a lot as a youth, um, particularly in either Europe or in America, 
having dealt with a lot of people um, of different races, of different uh, nationalities and backgrounds, um, I see good and I see good values and I see um, worthwhile values to try and, uh, I guess, aspire to in many people from many places across the world. Um, the church itself um, that I guess I'm here representing this evening um, is a multicultural church. The headquarters are in Salt Lake City in America, um, but the, the church itself is in over 150 countries across the world. Um, we provide humanitarian aid to over 160 countries across the world. Um, and we have, uh, I mean, here in Norwich, if you came to Norwich on a Sunday, you will find members from Africa, from the Philippines, from China, um, from America, from England, um, Wales and Scotland as well. Um, so that I come from, an, I guess, a, a background where I've seen an awful lot of people from a lot of uh, backgrounds. Thinking about values then, values for me are the, the keystone of society, obviously. Um, I started thinking about, as a parent, you know, what values do I try to instill in my home? And do they really represent what I believe is across you know, the whole of the country? Um, I try to teach my children to be honest, to, be integ to have integrity. I try to teach them to be respectful of others. I try to teach them to um, allow others the opportunity to not only have their beliefs, but to also have the opportunity to share what, um, to, to participate in things and to share what they feel. Um, and I'm, as I, as the more I've thought about that, the more I believe that for a large proportion of the country, I believe those sorts of values will probably sit true. And I would imagine with most of you here this evening, are they really British values? I think I'm like Roderick. I think they're more human values. Um, the more people I have met from different places, the more I see those values in, in their lives. The more I see um, things like uh, faith and integrity, um, the more it instills in me a confidence that people are good across the world. Within the, the church, we have um, a set of beliefs that kind of describe what the church believes in. They're called Articles of Faith. Um, I just thought I would share with you the 11th. So the 11th Article of Faith that uh, the church produced says, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience, and we allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. And that for me is, uh, I guess, a good example of the church's views on values. Um, the church is very much a, a, a believer in all men um, and women have the same rights. They should be allowed to, to speak. They should be allowed to teach. They should be allowed to participate in voting. They should be allowed to do all of the, the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it then made me think about, well, actually, values have changed over the years here in Britain, haven't they? Um, we've gone from the suffragette days. We've gone, I don't know if we had too much of the racism um, back in the day or whether that was primarily in other areas. I know in, in Atlanta, where I lived, racism was still very much uh, an issue. And there were many people that battled against it, trying to bring that value of respect and Tolerate, uh, toleration um, more to the forefront in people's lives. They were trying to, to break the pattern of years and years of children being taught the way that parents had believed in the past. Um, I was thinking as Charles actually was talking earlier, do the values in Britain change from generation to generation? Yes. Have they changed from prime minister to prime minister? You know, does what Theresa May believe in change the values that we had from when it was David Cameron or Tony Blair or even going back to Winston Churchill and some of the uh, 
you know, the more famous uh, prime ministers of, of yesteryear. Um, and I guess ultimately what I've come down to is I actually believe that while the prime minister may have focused on trying to get values into schools, and I, I looked up the uh, the British values that they that they were promoting, democracy, rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. And they're all very good things. And trying to teach those to our youth is a wonderful um, aspiration. But ultimately, what is the real building block of society? It's families. And ultimately, what we need to be able to do is to get these values instilled in our homes. Parents, whether it's as a, a husband and wife living together, whether it's a single parent having to raise their children on their own, whether it's a same-sex partnership where um, they're raising them as, as, um, as a same-sex couple. Ultimately, we need those values to be taught um, within the home. And only then, I believe, will we actually make a real difference in society and have a real impact on, on bringing the type of tolerance, these types of values that we, we aspire to um, into, into society and into our generation today. Just a final thought. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we try to teach our youth in the church, so this comes from uh, uh, the, the theme that we have for our young women in the church. This is the group 12 to 18. Um, and they, they pretty much quote this every Sunday because they like, and for my girls, they like to, to get this into their minds and they really are trying to live these values. Um, the values that they aspire to are faith, divine nature, individual worth, knowledge, uh, choice and accountability, good works, integrity and virtue. Um, for some people, um, these sorts of values are mocked. And I know that the, um, I know in America when I was there, that there were many people in students across universities that would mock those sorts of values. Um, virtue, no sex before marriage. That being something that was special and reserved for a, a married couple is something that was seen as old fashioned. It was seen as repressive. Um, for me, it's something that is something that I cherish. It is something that holds families together. It stops families from being ripped apart um, because of the actions or the thoughts of one member. Um, it brings a strength and a unity and a, stabilized, a stabilization um, for children and for families that enable them to truly experience happiness and joy. Um, these sorts of values that we try to teach to our young people and that I hope that we as uh, the more experienced generation um, try to hold faithful to are the sorts of values I hope that as a society here in Britain and other societies across the world that we can continue to hold that torch um, high and to make sure that we um, give the rising generation the best possible opportunities. Um, I think that's it. Steve, thank you. thank you very much indeed. <laughs> very clear. Thank you very much indeed. Um, our final panellist is Elam um, Atakav from the British Muslim Values Project, which is based here at UEA and is trying to explore what these values are in the context of the Muslim uh, communities more generally. We're delighted you're here today, and off you go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm actually a senior lecturer in film and television and media studies. So what I want to cover, usually in a seminar room, for example, when you have students and you go through the room asking everyone to give their thoughts, and then the last person always says, well, it's already been said. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to uh, perhaps offer a different perspective by looking at the media's construction of British values and what they mean in this particular discussion. So March 2015 marks a report whereby it's been revealed and also picked up in a TV program by the BBC called Muslims Like Us. I don't know how many of you have seen that, but I'm happy to discuss that later on in the Q&A. 
55, I quote, 55 percent of British voters posit a fundamental clash between Islam and the values of British society. And following this, um, of course, was the Casey Review, which was published um, in December 2016 which referred to these kind of issues as a failure to talk about all this um, and how it leaves the ground open for the far right on one side and Islamist extremists on the other. And it went on to saying, these groups are ideologically opposed to each other, but actually share the same goal, to show that diversity and modern Britain, or Islam and modern Britain, are somehow incompatible, but of course they are wrong. That's quoted from the Casey Review as well. How I come to thinking about religion and British values, whatever they mean, um, in relation to media, is through a 2011 course, that, a module uh, that I established at UEA, which was deemed as the first of its kind in the UK, which was called Women, Islam and Media, which really tried to critique the media's representation of Muslim women. And it started off when I saw in back in 2005 and ended up writing an article about it, the image on a Time magazine cover um, of Mona Lisa in veils. And it was the article itself was talking about this tension of Muslim immigrants and their influx into Europe and how it changes European kind of cultural values. So I'm taking it from British to European. And then at UEA we decided with my great colleagues from the press office to do a press release about this course, which was about women, Islam and media. And did we receive good feedback from um, the media? Well, not good feedback as such, good response. So it went, the news went from The Guardian to Marie Claire, don't ask me why it was Marie Claire, to Huffington Post and beyond. Um, and an international coverage it received, which was great, but every single time... Um, the news piece came up in the news, they used a woman in a burqa, which is precisely what the module was trying to critique. And then I learned one thing out of the whole process of sending your um, module as a press release, the news about it as a press release, do not ever read the comments by the public underneath the news piece. Um, because I was referred to, I like these, um, an alien who came to this country, to our country, to promote Islamist ideology. These were British ones. Um, I was called a terrorist who teaches fantasy at our universities. And somebody questioned, in this day and age, don't you think at time we were done with teaching fantasy as though it is fact? And another person said, are you one of those to whom religion is your very reason for living? I'm not even religious, but not that I need to justify that on this occasion. And obviously what I did was to copy and paste these comments and put them on a blackboard on the PowerPoint and get my students to think more critically about why that module existed and people's responses from within the UK to such topic. And it created great debate and students produced a lot of um, amazing work which ended up us with us contributing, in fact being invited to contribute to the recent House of Lords report on um, religion and belief in British public life. And students' work got quoted there as well. But what the students and I, our research was trying to say was that the media itself and media people working within the media who construct lots of the images that we are surrounded by when it comes to British values and religion and this clash and this tension was predominantly to do with religious illiteracy. Um, and of course, women and women's images, women's bodies were made as, you know, or used as focal points of debate, political debate, and to kind of represent that tension. And overall, as the uh, final report quoted our research, the media's construction of what it meant to be a Muslim, what it means to be a Muslim, rather, in the UK, is highly problematic. And obviously, with the uh, Casey report and this religion and belief in British public life report, we get to see an increase within the media texts, which are much more perhaps liberal in terms of their depiction of Islam. 
and Muslims like us is one of those cases. And as Charles mentioned, with, uh, together with uh, Lee uh, Marsden and uh, Lee Jarvis, we are running a Research Council UK funded project, a research project on British Muslim values. And I want to give that as an, another perhaps empirical example, which I, I would be very happy to expand on later on. So we looked at uh, Cameron's speech in 2014, in which he talks about British values as freedom, tolerance, respect for the rule of law, belief in personal and social responsibility and respect for British institutions. And then we looked at the Casey review, we looked at the other House of Lords report around religion and um, belief in British public life. And then we decided, obviously, in reflection to media's illiteracy around this clash, this topic, this tension, we decided to give voice to people who define themselves as Muslims and make their own stories. So rather than us making films um, or media stories about Muslim people, we decided that we would give them cameras and get them, provide them with filmmaking training so that they went away and provided video autoethnographies whereby they told their own stories because this is precisely what the media is lacking, at least within the UK, if not beyond. Uh, because lots of the texts, like Muslims Like Us, um, or lots of other ones over the past um, few months as well that have emerged within the media, they almost always create a binary opposition between Muslims and non-Muslims. Even though they are critiquing that tension, they are reinforcing and reproducing that clash between Muslims and non-Muslims and British values in that regard. So within this project, we're at a very British Muslim values project. We're at a really early um, um, time at the moment where our filmmakers um, are from east of England. So that's our focus, Bedford, Ipswich, Luton and Norwich. And we currently have three filmmakers, but we're going to in total have eight filmmakers. And they have received training from BBC Voices to make uh, films and they went away and three of them came back and we were doing the um, editing of it uh, last Saturday. And they are creating their own stories as to what they define as British values. And I wish I was at a point here to say, these are the findings that they've come up with, but we have yet to, we have seen a very, very brief kind of snippet from the films they're making at the moment. And, um, but uh, maybe next year when we do Keswick Hall debates, we might come back with uh, both Lees and tell you about the outcomes and show the films. So I'll leave it there. But those are the kind of empirical kind of case studies, if you like, two of them that I wanted to share with you this evening. But thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Very much. Well, I, th I think you'll all agree we've had a tremendous uh, set of contributions to kick us off. We've got now about half an hour for discussion between yourselves and the panel about the issues that have been raised. Um, and uh, what, what I'm going to do in a second is to take questions in threes from the floor and then ask the whole of the panel to respond to the points. What struck me in the uh, various contributions was a set of issues which remain very, very difficult. Um, human values as opposed to British values. What are the human values? Uh, the issues of sex in various ways, whether sex within or without marriage, sexual relationships, same-sex relationships, and so on. Are they part of the values that we're talking about in this area? The role of the media generally, you particularly highlighted at the end in what you said, but I think it's a very interesting reflection on the values which the media helps uh, encourage uh, across the population as a whole. And this core issue which Graham raised about the institutions of society and the importance of trust within them and how we relate trust between individuals and trust between uh, organisations. Perhaps I could just kick off with one question before going to the wider group. If one takes the human values idea, which I think all of you were edging towards rather than, quote, British values, is it really the case that human values in Britain, in uh, Russia, in Saudi Arabia, in North Korea, uh, in the United States, um, in Greece, I don't know, are they all the same universally? Or are there, in fact, not rather different values which underlie those different societies in the way that they operate. And I can see the attraction 
of the liberal human values approach. I use the word liberal in praiseworthy terms rather than uh, critically. But does it actually reflect the different cultures and values in completely different societies across the world? I just wonder if all of you could just comment on that and whether it's possible to get to agreed human values or whether in fact they're very different in all the different places. I'll just go down the same order you've just spoken now. We'll go, just go down the platform. Just a minute or two on that I'd appreciate. And then while you're collecting your thoughts and then I'll uh, go to the floor. Um, I, I'm actually going to answer you, Charles, by referencing um, um, a Roman senator from the 4th century whose name was Symmachus. And um, when I was um, a student, I discovered a letter that Symmachus had written. It was published in somewhere or other. And um, I've had it. It's uh, a, a piece of paper that's now falling to pieces, but I've had it on my desk um, all my adult life. Um, he was writing to the Emperor Justinian, who was requiring him to give up his Roman pagan values and to be a Christian. And he was asking for the right to remain as a pagan. And he said, um, do not the same stars cover us all? Does not the same sky cover us all? Not by one avenue only can we arrive at so great a truth. Not by one avenue only can we arrive at so great a truth. And it's kind of been my touchstone, which is a little weird for a rabbi. I know, a pagan Roman. Um, and, and Charles, that would be my, my answer to you, that I, I agree with you 100% that there are all sorts of different values and that the values that we have in Britain largely may not reflect, I'm just pulling this out of a hat, the same values in Russia. But the essence must be to look where we have values in common. And we must, whatever our values are, surely be able to have the ability to listen to one another. Because if we can't respect the differences, then we're on the path to war. Steve? Um, yeah, I guess I... I think I'm probably a similar opinion that I can't imagine that the values that um, we've talked about today are necessarily held across the world um, in all homes, in all hearts. Um, but I guess my foundation would be that um, we are all children of uh, a loving Heavenly Father who has given us this opportunity to be here. Ultimately, we all have the, uh, the same foundation within us um, and a lot of what changes from from place to place or home to home or individual to individual a lot of that comes from the the upbringing and the experiences that they have had as I said living in America it was uh, very much um, there was still a lot of racial feeling and a lot of racial behavior um, in the deep south um, and they weren't bad people they were good people but they still had those thoughts and feelings because of how they had been raised. So I, I don't really answering the question in terms of, is there? I guess there isn't. Um, should there be? I would hope so. I would hope that every individual has a feeling of wanting to be loved and respected, of needing or, or um, desiring to have the ability to do whatever they want to do in terms of work or worship or... Um, their political views um, and that for me is the thing that we ought to be aspiring to um, just one final thought it, it strikes me that with the technology that we have today that we are very much less um, Britain and Britain is excluded from the rest of the world because the world has become so, so much a smaller place now um, you can see what's happening in China, in Afghanistan, in uh, Nigeria, in wherever else in the world very easily. And for me, I think the values that are across the world, are, um, they don't have that ability to be segregated and separated from, from the rest of society anymore. Thanks. Graham? Yes, I mean, there have been lots of attempts, of course, over the years to try and create some set of universal values. Um, the trouble is human beings are not on the whole loyal to abstractions. Um, you know, we don't give our life for abstractions. We might give our life for somebody else. Um, uh, we want to see, 
I think, values incarnated, as it were, in, in human beings. And, and so for me, I think there is something about human dignity and respect for creation which um, can be regarded as um, something universal, but it will be reflected in very different ways in different societies. Um, so I think I wouldn't... I, I understand why we're using the term human values, but what I would want to say is that um, the values that you would seek to see in every society are those which enhance human dignity and respect the creation which, of which we are part. Uh, and how is it that we can therefore have a critique of the values of a society? It must be where that human dignity is not enhanced and where the, the created order is not respected. And we begin with our own society in uh, critiquing ourselves rather than critiquing others. Uh, and we've got a lot um, to learn about that, so I don't think we're, I don't think we're wanting to create uh, abstractions, um, because most people are loyal to family, community, friends, other human beings whom they love and whom they cherish, and uh, and so from so so I, I think it's inevitable that there are going to be different um, understandings of values. For example, courage is admired in many societies, but far from universally. Um, now, should it be? I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure it's necessarily uh, a fundamental human value, but there are some societies in which you would want to um, say that courage would be very important as uh, a promoter of human dignity. Thank you, Aileen. Well, this is a difficult one. Are they human values? Are they all the same? I think I agree with my colleagues here. There are differences in texture culturally, differences in fabric of cultures. Um, I come from, for example, a Turkish background, and it's quite different, and the kind of issues that I deal with in my research signify that there are other problems before we get to the issues like gender equality, for example. You know, we need to come to terms with those kind of things before trying to figure out human values. But I think my problem would be who decides who gets to say what human values are um, and how do we collectively agree on all those values because those are when differences are going to be perhaps productive yet at the same time very much creative of tension. So also individuals' experiences of what human values m would mean is important. Um, one thing that I wanted to say earlier on, which I didn't, is I'm one of the survivors of, survivors of the life in the UK test. I don't know how many of you have done that, but if that's a kind of a representative of what British values kind of mean, that uh, couple of hundred word pages of, um, of two books, and that is imposed on you as British values. So if we're deciding that you have to accept and you have to understand and memorize at least for half an hour, uh, if not beyond, and internalize and, you know, of course, put in practice. But when it comes to human values, my question is who decides and how can we collectively decide on what's what? Thank you. I thought that was very interesting. Over to you now. Uh, we've got two colleagues with mics, so could you indicate? Somebody right at the back, just in front of there. Somebody right at the back, that side. Uh, have we got a third person? A gentleman just there. So I'll take those three first. Could you give your name, please, and any particular interest you have? Margaret Wheels. Um, you've mentioned that the values have changed, and we ha have only to think of imperialism, press gangs, the Wars of the Roses. Uh, those have shaped our history, have shaped what we are now. One thing which made me think very uh, deeply was an, a holiday experience in Spain. And I think the little village was Frigiliana, high up in the mountains, uh, I think above Malaga. And the tour guide told us that her name was Anna Medina Molino. And she said that her family 
had a long history, several centuries long, so that Anna was her Christian name from the Christian part of her family. Medina was from the Muslim part of her family. And Molino was from the Jewish part of her family. And I have been very moved by that. Thank you. Gentleman just in that corner, that's right. Thank you. David Patey. Um, the last contribution from the panel very much picked up something I wanted to ask about, which is who decides. You know, it's not that long ago that the state, which Bishop Graham described as a controlling servant, told us in Section 28 that schools could not talk about homosexual relationships as a pretended family relationship. Now the state's changed its mind. So my question is, are British values safe in the hands of the state? Very interesting. And thirdly, the gentleman just there. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ken Leggett, <clears throat> a very interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. And uh, perhaps a simple point that the panel would help me on, because it was Bishop Graham that picked up a point from all the many meaningful words that were being used. And he quoted, um, I think he referred to a, a core values, and then he picked out the word tolerance, and then he said, does this mean tolerating bullying? And I wondered if the panel would help me on, if you look at each of the words that were well used and put over, it's the interpretation of those words that is quite a challenge for me. And would be, I would welcome the panel's view on that. And the, the lady who spoke at the end, she also referred to something similar to that. Thank you, Jam. Thank you. Three interesting questions. Graham, would you kick us off, please? Yes. Um, fascinating about the, the, the three names, which, of course, is a reminder that um, for all of us, we're, um, we're in a, we inherit all sorts of uh, different values from different parts of our families, even if we don't always recognise it. Are British values um, safe in the hands of the state? Well, no. Um, uh, but fortunately, um, we don't rely simply on uh, the state to be the carrier of values. Um, we, we create the community of the nation. That's, in a sense, what I was trying to say. Um, and if we live in a society where we um, trust each other, because at the heart of what everybody else was saying here is that um, whatever values we practice, and values in themselves, are, um, the, the very word, of course, has got to have some root um, understanding in uh, an understanding of morality or society. I mean, values don't exist in a vacuum of their own, um, but they've got to be practiced in some way. They've, they've got to, they've, there's got to be a practical um, outworking of any values that you've got, and that can only happen in families, communities, and within society. I think how you interpret them, I mean, one of the reasons uh, I began with that the, those open academy values um, and one of the things we quickly learned there was that you just can't have single words without offering some interpretation and I can remember within the school council there having a big debate about what, the, what was forgiveness um, and why should forgiveness be a value which is how we ended up with that um, phrase I think um, after a sometime that about forgiveness being a friendship preserver uh, because most of us I think have recognized in our lives uh, I certainly have how your failure to forgive loses you friends um, so it, 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 it it's it is important to interpret who is the interpreter well of course we are all our own interpreters but actually society generally um, interprets for us uh, and that goes back to to um, David's point about um, the shifting sands of um, the interpretation of our values, which comes through um, through the way that, uh, that um, politicians interpret them. Thank you. Uh, Adam. Oh, 
different ones. I really appreciate the, um, the your experience over your Spanish holiday about the three names. And I think, aren't we all very rich and, you know, richly productive as human beings? And we should perhaps think about celebrating th those kind of plurality[s] and backgrounds that we have, we inherit. Um, the... <laughs> Are British values safe in the hands of the state? Is anything safe in the hands of the state? Um, but I'm going to change that question and ask in relation to what I have been saying, are British values safe in the, uh, safe in the hands of the media, which is predominantly the tool for the state to communicate those ideas? And those are the ones, if we are so surrounded by the media, if those are the values that we are living with on a daily basis that are imposed upon us, that permeate it through our lives, through the media that we use, um, we really need to stop and think about who owns that media, what's behind it and what kind of idea. This is not just only true for the UK, of course, it's much more complicated, sophisticated than that at different international levels. And also, who decides to get what messages get out? Muslims like us, I was listening to an interview earlier today with one of the people who went into that big brother-like house with ten other people, well, nine other people, all Muslims, to live together for ten days and BBC recording their experiences and, and so on. And she was reflecting on how her experiences as an independent single woman was completely omitted, as a Muslim woman as well, who was uh, in, financially independent, was completely deleted out of the story and what they picked more like it cherry-picked, was the stories about uh, a much more radical kind of uh, Islamist person talking about um, his um, sexist ideas, because that's what created more debate. I think we really need to be very careful around that state and media relationship, because that will reveal perhaps more complicated issues around who's talking to who to decide what these values are, and how they get to be sugar-coated and sent to us by the media. Perhaps that's a very passive approach, but I will stick with that for now. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, um, Margaret, I guess your experience just reminded me, I didn't actually see the programme, but I remember hearing about it, the Who Do You Think You Are um, programme, where um, I believe it was someone that was quite racist in their views, discovered that they had uh, the, in their family history um, the very people that they uh, obviously had ill feelings towards was very much a part of their background um, and it does strike me that as I think has, has been said already that actually you know we don't really know necessarily exactly who we come from and the values that they held um, so it's, it's definitely something worth remembering and something to, uh, to consider um, as we go forward. Um, whether we're safe in the hands of the state uh, I think I'm the same opinion as Graham. I guess that's up to us at the end of the day. Um, we have in the church an additional book of scripture to the Bible called the Book of Mormon. Um, one excerpt in there um, from the history of the people, the, ki the king at the time was getting to the end of his life. He knew he was going to die soon. He wanted to bestow the kingdom upon one of his sons, and the sons basically they all said no. Um, and then it came to a, a question was put to him, well, we need the king, so, you know, who is it going to be? And he very wisely said, don't have a king. You know, if you had a righteous king, he said it would be great. He said, but you run the risk of having someone in who will try to misuse the power, you know, and you'll end up with an argument between people um, and it can lead to war and bloodshed and all the rest. He said, so don't do that. And he set up a system um, where... There were judges put in place, and they ruled by the voice of the people. And basically, uh, his, his thoughts were that while the people remained um, in the majority righteous, all would be well. It would only come to the point where the majority of people um, had changed and uh, become bad that they would then be in trouble. Um, so that thought just came to mind as I was thinking about that. Ultimately, it's down to us to make sure that our government and even the media um, portrays the sort of messages that we believe are the right messages to portray. And as long as there are good people that are fighting for 
the right sorts of messages to be put out, um, then we can influence the values that are held in society. Um, we either don't watch the programs that we don't believe in. Big Brother is never something that you will ever hear me talking about because I find the whole concept of Big Brother appalling. I don't believe it teaches anybody good values. And I'm sure there must be some good in there somewhere. Um, but everything I hear, it's like, so I don't watch it. Um, if nobody watched Big Brother, how long would it last on the, st on the, uh, on the wire? Um, we also know that the number of complaints that go in against these sorts of things, so if there's something on there that people find offensive, the number of complaints will dictate whether that sort of thing is allowed to carry on. And again, you know, do we stand up in this uh, world of social media and media and actually make our voices heard, or do we sit and kind of hang our heads and, and allow things to go on around us? So I think for me it's, um, I hope that, you know, I will have the courage and the the integrity to stand up and be counted when those moments come. Um, I hope us as a society will always try to hold true to the things that help people to feel loved and cherished and valued and respected and all of those wonderful words that we've talked about. And I guess coming to that as a final point, um, I'm not sure about the interpretation of words and who should define those. I guess some are very easy to interpret and generally speaking there's a, a good way of interpreting it either way. I'd actually wrote, uh, written down right at the very beginning tolerance and tolerance versus protecting other values and other people's um, dignity and feelings of self-worth. Where does tolerance come in? And I guess that's very much a personal um, choice as to what am I going to be tolerant about? How much tolerance will I allow? Or as I said previously, am I going to stand up and actually be counted when I see something or hear something that I don't agree with and that I feel is actually imposing upon somebody else's rights? Thank you. Uh, Roderick. Um, Margaret and David, in a sense, said something that was quite similar. Um, Margaret said values have changed, and uh, David said, are British values safe in the hands of the state? Um, I think Margaret is right, values have changed, and I think values change in a way that we can't always work out why they have changed. But it's something to do with um, a plurality of people in society who decide, maybe not even decide, but start acting in a way that causes change. And I don't think it's generally the state that does these things, I think the state is reflecting where we as a society are. I really encourage you to listen. At the moment, there's a Radio 4 program called Consenting Adults. Uh, the lawyer, Helena Kennedy, is talking about, uh, and I think this is very much goes with what Bishop James was saying, about trust, that um, a government can only rule with the consent of the population, is Helena Kennedy's argument. And she's presenting it now because she's very taken by the banners that are appearing across uh, Trump's America not in my name, and also um, here in Britain by people possibly on both sides of the Brexit debate who felt they were lied to, who felt they are lied to, and therefore say that they won't accept whatever is decided. If that trust goes, if that consent goes, that's where we break down. Listening to society slowly changing and the government following it I think is very imprecise and fascinating science. But I think that that's what's happened. Um, you, you mentioned about the, uh, you mentioned David about the different attitude uh, towards gay people. Well, you know, I personally think that, um, I think of Alan Turing, um, a great British war hero who was hounded to his death for being gay by the state. And now, whatever it is, 60 years later, the state is apologizing. I think that that's the state following on from how society has changed, rather than the state telling us how we should change. So I am not so scared of the state. Um, tolerance. Uh, I think it was Ken mentioned uh, tolerance. Tolerance is a very difficult one, isn't it? I lived for many years in the United States. Um, if somebody wants to... Um, stand up and badmouth me as a Jew or as a gay person, that is their First Amendment right to do so. 
If that happens in this country, however, I can have recourse to the police and it can be seen as, as hate crime. There are two different ways in which we view how, where the boundaries of toleration lie, uh, which I think are completely fascinating. But for me, tolerance has to be the cornerstone and the touchstone. It seems to me that if we don't live in a society where we tolerate different views, and I'm including somebody bad-mouthing me because I'm Jew or, or a gay person, if we don't tolerate different views, then what hope do we actually have to live together? I have the right to try and change people's minds, but I think they have the right also to say what they think about me. Um, perhaps I am saying this because I'm Jewish. Um, uh, you know, I think of my mother's cousins who lived for hundreds of years in Germany very happily and successfully, and then, because tolerance disappeared, ended up in the gas chambers. That seems to me what happens when we don't have tolerance. I just want to say one thing uh, about Margaret's remark. Um, it reminded me very much of a book called Identity and Violence by Amartya Sen. And what he essentially argues in that, around the word identity, is every individual, everybody in this hall, has a complex of different identities. So I'm a man, I'm a, an ex-politician, uh, I'm uh, uh, somebody brought up in Hampstead Garden suburb in London, uh, I'm an Norwich City supporter, whatever it may happen to be. And his point is I have the right, every one of us has the right, to decide which of these identities are important to me and which I wish to emphasise in the way I conduct myself. Uh, and that is my right absolutely and it will change over time. And the opposite point to that is that nobody has the right simply to define me by one of my identities and say that particular identity is uh, who you are. So all those who have kind of blanket condemnations of people who are, I don't know, who are Packies or Norwich City supporters or whatever it might happen to be, that is an illegitimate uh, way of conducting your set of views. Everybody has to be respected for this complex of different identities which ev for every individual is different and which every individual may decide how to express those identities at different times of their life in different ways and should be able to do so freely and to be respected for that. And I found that when I first read the book a real insight to thinking about things because certainly the state coming on that did have a tendency and still does in many ways to classify people by one identity or a small number of identities rather than recognising that every individual has a whole range of identities which they themselves have the right to decide what they give priority to at different points in their lives. Time for one final round of questions. I've got two here, three. Actually, we've got a lot of questions. It's suddenly... I'm, I'm going to... I, I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to ask quite a number of people to chip in and then ask you to respond to them and to wind up at the same time. So the first is up there. Ian Harvey, I'm interested to know what the panel's views are on the gap between the manifest British values that are currently displayed in our society and those more aspirational values, which I guess people like Ofsted and others have in mind when they're promoting them in schools. Okay, and that side, the lady down here, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Salmo. Um, RE in school is cited in many reports as playing a key role in promoting British values as well as so a spiritual, social, uh, moral and cultural education. How do you think it can best fulfil this role? Mm. Big question. There was somebody up there as well. Yep. And then. Um, we have talked about values and uh, it is clear that uh, some values which are, universe, which are uh, universal that are reflected across cultures. But my question is um, whether some values are relative to the environment. And the second one is whether those values can be interpreted on the basis of them being dynamic. Okay, thank you. There's somebody else on this side. That's right, the gentleman there with uh, white hair. Sorry, uh, very gently tinged hair. <laughs> That's you, yes. Uh, Ron Ingemals. Um, Bishop Graham used the phrase, uh, British society at its best. And my question is similar to the first one just now. 
do you see that where are the points or the uh, events at the moment to take place which are not at the best? Okay. I've got two more just here. There's somebody just there. That's right, just here. Lee in the front, then Lee at the front. Yep. Uh, Bradley James, I'm a PhD graduate at UEA. I just wanted to draw something out a little further um, from what the rabbi at the end has been saying a few times tonight. Um, and that's on the subject of um, this question of human values and this question of universal values and the impossible search for them, perhaps. There is a, a perfectly good document of universal uh, principles in human life. And of course, it comes from the UN and it's 70 years old now. Uh, and it was signed to by all the nations on the planet. Um, I'd like to make the case, though, that the idea of values as distinct from rights, no matter how important they are to the individual, and they surely are, um, are meaningless as a public good unless we attend first to the rights that we've already agreed on and which we have agreed on now for decades. And specifically, of course, the leading signatories of those rights in the UN Declaration of Human Rights have violated those principles at will um, for whatever reasons they saw fit. And I think until we can actually agree that we agree on the rights that we agreed to back then and we're going to honour those rights, values are to be drawn from those and from our observation of them and not from individuals, in which case it is just rhetoric and it is divisive. Thank you. And then right down to the front, just checking, and then I'll come to you finally. Is there anybody else I've missed who wanted to say something? So Lee and then the two on that side. Right, Lee. Thank you. Um, all of the panellists have disaggregated uh, values from the British um, idea of sort of British values, and yet government insists on using um, British values um, as a designator of I'm not quite sure what. But um, what I, I was wondering if the panel could sort of just uh, cover um, fairly briefly, really, is whether that term British values is actually helpful, um, whether it's actually damaging, or whether it's completely irrelevant in terms of building community relations within Britain. Thank you. And then the two on that side, yes. Richard Kappa. Um, there's been a discussion, the interrelationship between trust and values has been mentioned. And the, um, the question is, there seems to be an increasing lack of trust in this country, especially in recent times politicians, of all sorts of institutions. How do we rebuild trust, which makes give us a sense of British values? Thank you. And the final question, gentlemen, just down here. Uh, hi, my name is Oshan. I was wondering whether you think there's a danger in holding values as universal, as if we are able to, I don't know, see from a sort of post-ideological perspective when we consider uh, historically how we have always, as all communities, hold their ideals as universal, their values as universal. If we think about the uh, values under imperial empires, we thought of ourselves as you know, shining lights and liberating people, and whether uh, bringing values like democracy to Iraq could be brought in as a, an example of that, whether you think it could be dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that's eight questions, and I don't think the panel will be able to do, all be able to do with all of them. So I say to, to you, I'm going to come to you first, Steve. Uh, don't feel you have to answer all the questions and pick the ones that you can do to illustrate the points. And, and also, if you can combine your comment with any concluding thoughts you've got after this uh, conversation. Steve. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess an answer to the last one is that other danger in um, trying to have universal values. Well, yes, and I guess I'm then linking that to the values versus rights, or um, getting the the rights of people down first before we then look at the values. For me, um, I guess the the values that I hold dear to are based upon principles of human rights. It's um, as I said before, it's people. Um, having the right to feel loved, to feel um, able to live their lives in a way that, that they want to, to choose who they are, what they do, where they worship, how they worship, um, those sorts of rights to be, a, to be a part of a society that will respect them and will help them to 
have individual worth and to be able to be the person they want to be. Um, obviously, in all of these discussions, this isn't a simple topic, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it. Um, it's not, and I guess using the tolerance um, example again as, a, as a the example, it's not, as e it's not easy to say where the line of tolerance should stop. Um, we talked about, somebody asked the question about um, teaching the values in schools. And again, I guess I would go back to the schools are great and we need to teach our younger generation good values. We need to teach them to be more respectful um, and uh, more responsible in the way that they treat each other. Um, but also we need to put that back into the homes. And, I, and for me, this is where um, I don't think it's about British values. Uh, I think talking about British values can be damaging because I think people that aren't from Britain may see that as a, as a wall rather than a, um, just a statement of this is who we ought to be. Mm. Um, for me, it should be that as individuals and as families, we need to start treating one another better. We need to be more loving and kind towards each other. Um, personally, I believe in marriage is between a man and a woman. I believe that that's how God intended it to be. Um, does that mean that I don't respect somebody who's gay or in a same-sex marriage or has is a transvestite or no? Um, my brother's best friend is gay, um, and I have a great time with him. We have great fun together from time to time. Just because I don't believe the way that he does doesn't mean that you can't have good values. You can't respect one another. You can't be together in society. Um, so for me, it's. Um, we need to actually work much harder at um, instilling those values within ourselves and our homes and promoting them in society. Thanks very much. Aylan. Um, one of the things, uh, perhaps this is a response to Lee's question, um, whether British values are helpful, damaging or ir irrelevant. Um, I think we can turn them into being helpful in the sense that this is what's happening today, right? We're discussing it, we're thinking about it, we're reflecting on it. So it's, we can perhaps use it as a term, as a concept that creates discussion, that creates more dialogue within society. Um, and definitely, and there is an issue that needs to be identified here about voice, about visibility and audibility, about different voices being heard, different people being able to articulate what they understand of these values. Um, and so we can have a negotiation and a perhaps more collective response to uh, what these values mean or what human values mean for that matter. Uh, but I was watching a YouTube clip just before coming here. Um, somebody went to uh, Covent Garden in London, so a really popular place, and started asking uh, people um, what, Brit what they thought. They said, give, me, give us four words uh, that define British values. And 100% of the people they asked, they probably asked about 30 of them, that's what I've seen in the interview, they didn't know. They said, you're asking the wrong person. And they were uh, all British, from what I can gather. And uh, one person came up with cricket, <laughs> and the other one came up with a cup of tea. So that's as far as, um, as it goes. So maybe we don't know what we are who we are, what our values are as well. And also in terms of um, values and culture being very dynamic, um, one thing that I do teach and I do do research on is honor killings. Um, and I invite Norfolk Constabulary and Suffolk Constabulary colleague, colleagues to my class to talk about how these things happen everywhere. Right? And students, they ask students whether these things happen in the UK. They say, well, it's not part of our values, really, those kinds of things, violence against women. But they might happen because there are immigrants who moved here and so on, which is very othering. That's another thing because it suggests that the, we're not accepting that society is changing constantly. And we're, that's us. That's what's happened. And they ask the question whether they think forced marriage, female genital mutilation, honour killings happen within Norfolk. They all say, no, absolutely not. We're all fine here. This is nothing to do with Norfolk values whatsoever. And, uh, and they give them the numbers about how there are about 3,000 cases across a year. 
uh, within Norfolk that where these things are reported and they're left shocked. So we really need to question issues around voice, that's my final comment, and issues around creating dialogue and maybe British values they might, as damaging or irrelevant as they may be, they might be helpful in perhaps collectively responding to um, this very problematic and highly debated concept. So. Thank you. Uh, Roderick. Um, I, I'm ashamed to say, Bradley, that I have never read the, um, the UN um, Universal Document of Human Rights. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, why have I never read it? It was never brought to my attention at school, at university. Um, is that an excuse? I don't know. But it seems to me that uh, it should be a document, therefore, that we should all look at, that we should study, and we have the right to disagree with it. Um, but it's fascinating to me that you brought it up and that I don't know about it. So I will go away and look at it. That's one thing positive I can say about this evening. <laughs> Many positive things, but particularly that. Um, we've had the word... Um, imperialism mentioned twice. Um, Margaret mentioned it at the back earlier on, and Ocean, uh, you mentioned it as well. Um, it seems to me that in, in Britain, we look back on our imperial past as sort of Downton Abbey, upstairs, downstairs, the jewel in the crown, um, you know, Peggy Ashcroft riding down the mountain, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and it is something that we have never, I don't think, fully looked at and said, what was good about this adventure? What was bad about this adventure? What does it mean? To, uh, we've not done that. Other countries have done that because they've been forced to do that. But we have not done that. And I suspect that until we do that, then um, a great deal of the way in which we treat people who are not like ourselves is not going to get better. And that possibly we really need to look at the imperialist adventure and say, what was good? What was bad? Um, a topic for another time, possibly. Um, do I think the British values, that it's good to teach them, Lee, in school? In society, I, I've said all along this evening that, that the phrase makes me deeply queasy, and yet at the same time, I do think that there is a contract that if we come to live in this country, if my Jewish ancestors come to live in this country, there are certain ways in which we behave that my ancestors had to adhere to, and that I believe as a British person it was right they should have adhered to. Um, so I think that there are certain societal norms that come under the sway of the law that all groups need to know about. So I'm saying possibly we don't need a curriculum on British values, but we need, do need to know what is simply against the law in this country. And I'm only going to reference honour killings because you mentioned it, um, and I'm hesitant to do so because that's not from, from my culture. Um, but you've been talking about how the, the media portrays things. It is fascinating to see how the media completely misrepresents um, Sharia law in this country. For example, there are many Jews who have abided by halachic courts because they agree to that, but somehow the Daily Mail doesn't get exercised by that. It only gets exercised by Sharia courts. Why is that? Why are there certain groups in our society who get picked on? And maybe that goes back to my question about us facing up to our imperial past. And finally, I think, I just want to say, um, I love the word trust that's come out this evening. Um, it's a question of trusting those who are different from us and trying to see where we have values in common. And for me, it's always going to come down to tolerating and really getting to know the other, even if they seem so different from us. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham, a concluding comment. Well, I was, I was very glad um, cricket and a cup of tea got mentioned as British values, to which you could also add queuing, I think. Um, <laughs> you only have to go to some other places in the world to realise how valuable our capacity to queue is. Um, we, I, I think among the things that were asked were about British society at its best and events at the moment conspiring against British society at its best. It was very striking that how much of... Um, the rather unsatisfactory debates before 
and Brexit were about economics very largely. You know, would be we be wealthier whether we're in the EU or not? And very little about values. And yet I suspect quite a lot of people make, made their decision based on some instinctive understanding of what they thought were British values. Um, and then there was that important question that we oughtn't to forget on, at a Keswick Hall event, that what would RE do um, in order to um, promote good British or other values? Uh, I can remember asking um, a group of six formers doing um, religious studies A level why they did it, um, because I can say as a bishop, it never ever occurred to me when I was choosing A levels to do <laughs> religious studies or indeed read theology or religious studies at university. Um, and yet it's much more fashionable now. I mean, in, in it, I mean it's, it's popular. Um, it's extraordinary the way religious studies has grown. And one of the things um, it's been said to me more than once that this group said was it's it's one of the few subjects where the teachers ask you what you think, um, which is rather interesting in itself. And I think one of the significant points about our values by which we live is that they're not imposed on us, even though we, of course, seek to teach them to the next generation. We can't be passive recipients of the values of others. We've got to own them for ourselves. And so anything which causes um, the young, let alone ourselves, um, to think that these are not abstractions but are things by which we live, all that's very important to me. And I think it's also true that we should never think that we've achieved living by them. Um, they are, I think somebody asked about aspiration. There ought to be something aspirational about them. Um, one of the reasons why I'm a Christian is because there's a call to live beyond national identity. It's a call to be part of a coming kingdom of God. Uh, and that's about um, things not yet being achieved, to be striven for things that are in the future. Uh, and for our world to think that there's something that we've achieved that we want to protect seems to me precisely the most worrying signs of the world. You know, I listen to America first, and I fear it, really, because there's a sense that there's something here that you want to hold on to and you want to protect from all outsiders. Uh, so it's a sense that whatever values we have, they are those that we have adopted um, as part of a community, but we've made our own, but which we have never completely fulfilled, and they are actually things that lead us to a better world. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm just going to make one quick point on the RE and schools point, religious and ed education. The current framework was decided by the 1944 Education Act. Since, in the 73 years since, religion has changed in this country in many ways, schools have changed in this country in many ways. It set up a curricular regime where you have a different syllabus if you're going to school in Norfolk to if you're going to school in, for example, the London Borough of Hackney. And when we moved with my children at primary school from Hackney to Norfolk, there were completely different situations uh, that existed. It was almost as though you were talking about Hackney values and Norfolk values, let alone British values, uh, which are superior. I'll leave to others to decide. Um, but uh, I'm, in fact, doing work on this question uh, a lot at the moment. We published a pamphlet, a colleague of mine, on this about uh, two years ago because I think that the curriculum, the RE curriculum, has to be brought to deal with the contemporary reality of British society rather than simply accept the 1944 framework. I apologise, first of all, for having gone significantly over time. I'm interested by the fact that most people have stayed rather than walking out, despite going significantly over time. And I think the reason for that is we've had a really, really fascinating discussion. I think it's been really very, very interesting. Uh, it will go up on the uh, UEA website uh, after in the next uh, few days, and so you can go back to it if you want. But I think, firstly, I want on behalf of all of you to thank our panel, who've really given... Uh, really excellent intervention this evening. So thank you for all of you for, uh, for what you've contributed this evening. It's been really first class. And secondly, to...
thank you for coming. And uh, we've had all the questions have been absolutely excellent and have helped us take the conversation forward. And then thirdly, just to say that next week, uh, this Thursday, again at 6.30, is the third in this series of Keswick Hall Lectures, where I'll be talking to Stephen Timms, MP, MP for East Ham, who's a man of faith who's discussed faith in politics in a wide, wide variety of ways in his own, own role as an MP, including some shocking experiences like being attacked physically uh, in his constituency surgery and having to have the strength to deal with that in those circumstances, but nevertheless strongly defending the whole point that members of parliament have to be in touch with their electorates rather than going off into some uh, different area. But he's a good friend, and I think you'll find him interesting and illuminating on many aspects of this relationship. So thank you very much indeed for coming this evening. I hope we see most of you again uh, next Thursday. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed.